All right, so NAFTA has been in the news recently, and uh, it seems pretty confusing to figure out what's going on here. Uh, the, the news certainly doesn't make it easy to understand the issues. So I thought I'd take a few minutes to explain how these trade negotiations work and what's really going on here. Now, of course, you remember Donald Trump has promised to make America great again by, in part, implementing an America first trade policy. And what this means in real terms is that, for example, it, it places 200% uh, tariffs on Canadian company Bombardier to make it more expensive to U.S. consumers to buy Bombardier than to buy aircraft manufactured in the U.S. And what we see in the, the public in Canada is Bombardier taking a big hit and potentially having to lay off people and not doing so well. You hear a huge... Uh, <laughs> upwelling of, of uh, gnashing of teeth and cries of unfair from people at Bombardier. But the Americans say, well, so what? Our manufacturing sector is doing much better now because we've eliminated foreign competition. So how does a Canadian trade negotiator respond? Well, they might say, oh yeah, well, if you're going to restrict companies from selling to your citizens we're going to restrict your companies from selling to our citizens so then we we slap tariffs and trade restrictions on say dairy products and and we hurt the u.s dairy producers but our dairy producers then make out like bandits so negotiations go back and forth like this if you hurt bombardier we'll hurt your dairy if you hurt our auto sector we're going to hurt your softwood lumber sector and each sector or company that's going to be affected by tariffs or restrictions puts all sorts of pressure on its government to do something about this. And now put yourself in the shoes of, of a member of parliament. Imagine you're a member of parliament that was elected in large part by big unions and business cartels like dairy producers who, can, who, who rely on restricting competition to, to make big dollars. Well... If you don't do something about Bombardier employees facing layoffs because of these tariffs, you aren't likely to get re-elected, are you? So you go to the mat for Bombardier and you, you try to find ways to hurt companies in the U.S. that wield political influence. See, if you can hurt companies in the U.S. that wield political influence, then you might be able to apply enough pain to politicians in the U.S. who are worried about their popularity in re-election that they then soften on the Bombardier tariffs a bit and some sort of equilibrium is found in all the tariffs. Now notice this is not a free market equilibrium where supply and demand curves meet and prices are determined. Uh, no, this is an equilibrium of warring special interests, kind of like two rival gangs fighting each other to a stalemate and, and drawing territorial lines so that there isn't any more bloodshed. Yes, this war is very complicated because trade negotiators have to constantly weigh political influence and special interests against each other and make all sorts of political calculations about influence. But make no mistake, this is essentially a war between crony corporations, unions, and special interests, and you are the collateral damage. And so what I've talked about up till now is what is seen you know we see jobs lost and gained in these particular companies and sectors we see profit lines increasing and decreasing at bombardier and on canadian dairy farms but what about the unseen the unseen victims uh, that are the canadian and american people see now instead of buying cheaper aircraft from a competitive canadian company american airline companies have to buy more expensive locally made aircraft this means that their operating costs have to go up and of course the price of tickets become higher than it otherwise would have been it also means that these airline companies may not be able to expand cheaper service to more americans it means that they, that they have to use different aircraft to serve their customers and that they can't therefore serve the customers the way they wanted to serve their customers also you know saving and investing are key to improving the prosperity and wealth of an economy. And now you have 
undermine that very important mechanism of wealth creation and prosperity. But you'll never know this because you'll never see it. This is what economists call the unseen. It ultimately comes from uh, Bastiat's parable of the broken window. You know, Bastiat asked the question, would breaking all the windows in a town grow the economy or harm the economy? Well, a Keynesian might say that breaking all the windows stimulates the economy. We can see it stimulating the economy. Uh, I mean, just look, all the, uh, all the work that these uh, local window companies are now doing, look at all the money they're making, all the people that they're employing now, and the money that all these people are spending in the economy. By everything we can see, the economy is doing great. But this theory of economic stimulus fails to account for the unseen. All the ways that that money that is now being spent on fixing windows might have been used if those windows hadn't been broken. As surely the people of this town would be better off if the windows hadn't been smashed. And surely politicians understand this basic fact, right? I mean, they, they block trade to enemy countries during a time of war because they understand that it harms the economy of the enemy nation. So surely they understand that restricting trade to their own citizens can't be good for an economy. Well, the way they behave when it comes to trade is largely explained by public choice theory. I touched on this a little bit. Public choice theory basically says that the immediate seen benefits influence government policy over the unseen negatives. So for example, Sending Bombardier billions and billions of taxpayers dollars over the years doesn't cause a big pushback from the taxpayers because the taxpayers don't really notice the few dollars per year that they're paying in taxes to Bombardier. But Bombardier sure as heck notices the billions and billions of dollars that they get. Their unionized employees definitely notice that. So if that subsidy is threatened, Bombardier's union is likely to make a big noise about that and, and get very passionate and organize some political action and, and put a lot of pressure on politician, uh, on politicians. Uh, the taxpayers, on the other hand, aren't likely to do much of anything over the few dollars. And so these trade negotiations are influenced by, by the same types of forces. None of us are likely to complain that we're paying a couple extra dollars for milk than we otherwise would if trade was free. But dairy producers are sure going to make a huge stink if their livelihood is threatened by competition. So all that being said, how would I manage trade uh, if, if I were king of Canada? Well, the first thing I do is recognize the fact that the U.S. slapping a giant tariff on Bombardier is crappy for Bombardier and the people that work there. But the answer to that is not... I repeat, is not to hurt all Canadians by slapping tariffs on U.S. products that they might buy. Uh, hurting Canadians by forcing them to spend more money or deprive them of opportunities to buy products more suited to their needs should never be on the table as an option in a country that calls itself free. So I'd make a unilateral declaration of complete free trade. Or put another way, a commitment that says, I'll never hurt my own people. Even if the U.S. slaps a tariff on one of our companies, and even if the U.S. hurts its own people, I'm never going to hurt my people. And the next thing I might do is, is try to help Bombardier out by making American protectionists look like the idiots they are by maybe starting a campaign of educating Americans how these tariffs are harming their interests and their economy. I might point out the fact that their own government is doing to them what it does to enemy countries. <laughs> I mean, if restricting trade to countries makes them great again, makes their economy boom by forcing everyone to buy locally, then why are trade embargoes the first line of attack in a war? You mean that restricting trade to other countries hurts them, but restricting trade to your own people doesn't hurt your own people? Which is it? Does restricting trade hurt nations or help them? So at the end of the day, we can't control what other countries are going to do. Uh, we can't make them buy from our producers. We can't, uh, you know, we, we can't control their policy, but we can control ours. We can commit to giving 
our people freedom to trade. If other countries want to harm their own economies and make themselves less competitive in the world market, that's ultimately their own business. So don't let uh, special interest groups fool you. Don't let cronies convince you that this is more complicated than declaring unilateral free trade. These negotiations, these, these trade negotiations, are nothing more than a bunch of oligarchs trading your freedom away for money and power. And if someone tells you that we have to negotiate, you can be sure that they, they either have a, a self-interested agenda with little regard to their fellow countrymen, or they are economically illiterate and they're simply parroting the party line and the media talking points.